Environmental, social, and governance topics have historically been on the C-suite agenda, but it's really only been in the recent years with the evolution and expansion of ESG scope that is now materially influencing the way companies structure themselves, conduct business, and serve their customers. CDOs are now challenged with how they harness the power of their data assets and analytics to advance their organizations and drive meaningful, sustainable, and measurable growth and value. Join our KPMG Global ESG and Data Analytics Leadership as we explore those challenges and opportunities faced by our CDOs. We are live. Hello and welcome um, uh, to MIT CDO IQ uh, Symposium today. I have the great pleasure of having Carson Bonick with me from BAM, uh, who's the Chief Data Officer there. Um, and uh, honored to be here with Carson to talk about the drive to survive, building data intelligence inside the modern hedge fund. Um, Carson was recently named Data IQ 10 top most influential people. So it's an honor having you here, Carson. Thank you so much, Baz. It's a pleasure to be here. And I uh, appreciate everyone who's attending this late in the program. Thanks for sticking around wherever you are. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking to you from New York, though I'm based in Chicago. And yeah, wanted to cover a little bit, uh, maybe a little uh, behind the scenes around what uh, a CDO does and uh, some of the things that happen within uh, a multi-strat hedge fund like Ballyasney. Um, happy to take questions uh, as, as we uh, complete the presentation. Uh, I think uh, Baz mentioned that you can uh, also ping through uh, potentially the Zoom and um, we'll go through that as well. But really the intent here is just to take you a little bit behind the curtain. Uh, for those of you who are in similar positions as to mine, um, you know, I think a lot of this will resonate. And then for those who aren't, but maybe are aspiring to, uh, can sort of see a little bit of the philosophy that we take here at, uh, at the firm. So without further ado, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna jump into it. So I titled this Drive to Survive, given the popularity of the uh, F1 Netflix <laughs> um, program, but, uh, you know, I think it's an apropos uh, analog to what we've seen within, certainly within financial services over the last 30 years as it relates to data, you know, and I sort of always talk about sort of the evolution of data. Everyone here is obviously uh, works in, loves and lives data. Um, and that's always been true within financial services as well. But things have certainly changed. And, you know, um, if you were to look at what the industry uh, kind of looked like technology-wise and data-wise, uh, or in the early 90s even, you'd find that things were very, I would call them sort of very analog, right? Um, you know, where a lot of the strategies of the day were based on, um, you know, uh, pricing feeds, classic sort of market data, um, you know, uh, the rise of quant uh, and some of the larger uh uh, investment firms that specialized in quant were just in sort of the beginning stages. And, you know, a lot of that looked like a fairly statistical approach to data. The data wasn't that big. Uh, and you can have a lot of uh, informational advantage as a chief data officer, or as a firm that was looking for new data, you know. And as we roll forward, we kind of saw that through the 90s, that uh, methodology and really that doctrine of being a data-driven organization started to really take root. So, you know, in the early 90s to the end of the 90s, uh, certainly data was uh, a major uh, part of the competitive advantage of most of the financial investment firms like ours. Um, we, we were formed just around the turn of uh, the 2000s. And, you know, at the time that that marked really a, a seismic change in just sort of the availability and uh, diversity of data that one could use for firms like ours. And our job is obviously to 
take a lot of that information and to try to make great investment decisions with it, much like a manufacturer would take a lot of their data or metadata and try to you know, optimize um, you know, production processes or sales pipelines and the like. We don't necessarily have an external product, but there is certainly a lot of similarity to uh, the blocking and tackling of data. And through the 2000s, you saw that there was a big explosion within our industry in the use, availability, and really acumen required to be great in data. And you know, I like to I like to joke nowadays when um, you read, you know, the Wall Street Journal, or you read the Financial Times, or you look at Business Insider, I don't, you know, if you're interested in that type of thing, you'll find that there's a lot of nowadays, um, sort of anecdotal information around what big data means within finance, um, how we're using it. Uh, it's certainly true that a firm of our size, we're, you know, we're one of the larger multi-strat hedge funds. And by multi-strat, I mean, that we invest in lots of different markets and lots of different asset classes. You know, it might be equities or commodities or credit, fixed income, et cetera. Um, and underneath all of that is a massive data platform and data architecture, uh, which leverages things like satellite imagery data or uh, real-time weather information, um, or even that same market data that uh, was used in the 90s, but now is coming in in you know nanoseconds, and uh, we're trying to compete. Firms are trying to compete with getting closer to the source of the data, just so they can have a bit of a timing advantage in, in their decision making. So it's really evolved a lot, and that's what makes part of this so exciting to be in. Is you, you know to be a CDO nowadays, I believe, is really to be uh, you know a blend of a technologist, of you know a business leader, of certainly a, a data steward and and champion. Um, and I, I find it, it within finance, given the speed at which things change and the competitiveness about it, it's really a, it's really a remarkable ecosystem to um, try to navigate it and, and build in. So there's a, lot, there's a lot happening here that I thought I would then try to show everyone a really what this stuff then looks like in, in firms like ours. So one of the things that I think great leaders do and what i was taught by some of the great leaders i worked for is you know set vision for an organization like ours we're you know we call ourselves the data intelligence group we're about 120 people within the firm uh, covering all things from sourcing to data onboarding all the engineering you know mapping databasing you know apis sort of full stack uh if you will uh, but I've often found that within data and to sort of the, the best CDOs that I know that I try to steal stuff from, they always have a very clear mission for their group. And uh, ours is articulated in this way, you know, we're really there to give competitive advantage. But you'll note that it's not sort of, there aren't words like governance necessarily, although that's part of it. There aren't necessarily things like standards or, or some of the classic, I would say, uh, nomenclature and, and words that were used maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago as the industry was just sort of ramping up. It's really about competitive advantage and trying to do something innovative. Um, and I believe it has to, it starts with a lot of great technology. So engineering is something we definitely call out. Uh, so this is really our mission. This is our mission. And I think, I think you'll find that it's pretty similar to other folks in positions like mine at, at firms like mine, uh, we're all we're all trying to find competitive advantage. Um, and what, how we look at competitive advantage is sort of through a classic analysis lens. Um, and, you know, it begins with having a great sort of data sourcing effort. So probably like, you know, even if you're working at a, a consumer company or you're listening to this uh, Zoom call from a manufacturing company or, or biotechnology or something else, you know, certainly I think everyone could agree that finding novel data to answer business questions is a key facet to getting data right. And so in our case, we have a team uh, dedicated toward, uh, you know, scouring new data sources, looking at new vendors, uh, even looking for kind of data exhaust products that a firm may not realize could be used to answer some of the questions that our firm would, would hope to answer, you know, and look for kind of partnership opportunities along those lines. And then obviously uh, we're, we're collecting a lot of our own data and, and creating proprietary data. 
Uh, but it really begins with a great sourcing effort. And, you know, uh, having worked at, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies with sort of classic sourcing teams and contracting teams, you know, I would, I would delineate this from that in, in this is very much a proactive approach to, you know, finding new data that can help make decisions. It certainly involves contracting and all the legalese inherent in subscribing to things. But, you know, the, the, the North Star here is um, helping the business make decisions. Like, where can we find novel things to help us make better decisions? At least within a hedge fund like ours, and again, I've tried to make this fairly uh, ubiquitous uh, from, from my understanding of other firms like ours and certainly our own, you know, I think what you'll find is in looking at financial firms is there then becomes after you find the data, there becomes some sort of enrichment, right? That, that happens. There's the actual onboarding of the data. You know, you're going to the FT piece, you're going to the S3 buckets, you're using Snowflake, you're using Databricks, whatever you're doing, you're getting the data in and you're starting to then enrich that, normalize it, link it uh, such that people can do actual business intelligence on that. And, you know, in our nomenclature, business intelligence includes things like machine learning. It includes creating like predictive models. You know, we have meteorologists who are trying to predict the weather. Um, it also involves a lot of statistical analysis. And I bet that's consistent with a lot of folks listening to this too. And that data enrichment is where we spend a lot of our time. In fact, I would say that's uh, across our team, that's the bulk of our bulk of our effort. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of laying a foundation for, for what I'll talk about here a little bit in a, in a few slides around how we approach understanding where we should spend our time for this, for this type of work and how we align that to sort of business value, which I think is always a question in conferences like this and for myself and my bosses and, and, and folks in, in these types of roles. Um, at least at a hedge fund then, the real goal is obviously to monetize that data. And the monetization of data looks like making different investments, making different trading decisions, uh, et cetera. And, and you know, making sure that what we thought was gonna happen did happen. And if not, we do attribution as to why it didn't. And you know, it's, it becomes a bit of a virtuous cycle within uh, a firm like ours as we think about the application of data. And hopefully, you know, once you get the technology right, uh, you can get this flywheel spinning pretty quickly. Uh, again, we're, we still have a ton of work to do. And, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this as a data engineer or something, you know that the work is really never done. But, you know, this is sort of the path that I think you'll find a lot of financial firms are using at a high level uh, to think about the value of data for their business. Just a question that, yeah. um, Carson, on, on this slide is kind of two questions. Firstly, you, you know, that data enrichment, you know, you know, we hear numbers like 80% of the time is you know, spent preparing the data rather than actually having it ready for, um, you know, as you've got it here, monetization. So how much is automation and this, how much it is, are you automating and how much time are you actually spending and preparing and getting the data right? So that's right. Yeah, I would say I, the 80-20 world is a good one. You know, so, you know, a firm of our size has thousands of different uh, streams of data coming into it, thousands and thousands actually coming into it every day. Uh, and uh, yeah, as you said, normalizing that, ma making that fit to purpose or fit for analysis is a lot of work. Um, you want, do you, Baz, do you mind if I go off script a little? Yeah, 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 that's kind yeah, of Let yeah. me show you some stuff. So one of so here's something. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, if you guys don't mind. So yeah, I often get asked this by by our investors. Like, how do you how do you how do you make sure that um, you know you're spending your time on data that may provide value? What does that look like? And how do you um, you know uh, minimize the time? How how can you make that eighty percent more efficient? How do you automate that eighty percent that you just alluded to? Right. I don't think there's one single answer, but one of the things that we built was we built a portal for our data vendors to then submit data into the firm. Oh. So mm -hmm. here's a here's a website. This is a public website. And if you were a, a would-be vendor of ours, we would give you a login and you could then post your data into that. And we will, for you on the fly, do some statistical profiling of that data 
to show you a little bit of how we interpret it. Like, okay, you know, in our in our nomenclature, we talk in terms of returns, you know, outperformance, things like that. Um, and I'll tell you that, uh, you know, salespeople will often tell you that they've got some magic data set. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. And if you do, we definitely want to look at you first. And so we've built a, we, we call this tool Antenna. Uh, mm -hmm. Other firms have similar, similar kind of platforms. Um, mm -hmm. But the vendors post this, and then we will run a statistical analysis for them. They go through a little setup. And so they can see what we're looking at. And so in doing so, what we're, what we're actually doing is we're putting a little bit more of the burden of proof on them. And we're putting a little bit more of that normalization and standardization on them, Back right? Around. So this is the shape of the data that we would like to have you submit to us versus us just taking a bunch of, you know, unstructured data and having to spend three months parsing it out with regex and, you know, a bunch of ML or something. Yeah. Okay, no, that's a great, great uh, point. Putting the onus on the data provider to put, you know, put it in some degree of standards. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Point, yeah. um, and, you know, I think as, as providers, it's there, there's an incentive there because they, you, you know, you want to sell stuff. So yeah. it's sort of a, it's a, it's, it's a mutually beneficial thing. Okay. That's great. Um, Thanks. Did that answer your that question? Awesome. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Does. Thank you. All right. Well, one of the other real driving things about um, the finance industry that I'd highlight is sort of an evolution in the merging of how people make investment decisions. You know, uh, 20 years ago, if you were to look at a firm like ours or a, or a hedge fund, what you'd find is there is um, a great investor, a great trader with, you know, three or four analysts. They were talking to the company management. You know, they were um, doing a lot of channel checks. They were visiting, you know, kind of the whole, um, the big short model, right? Where they go down to Florida and they see, Who's actually applying for these mortgages? And uh, boy, is anyone really qualified for this? And they talked to the mortgage, really doing a pound the pavement approach to find great investment ideas. And then through the, through the 90s and 2000s, you saw the rise of systematic investing, which is programmatic trading, uh, quant, quant model driven trading. Uh, and now a day is what you'll find is you find this term called quantumental. And quantumental is really trying to take the best of both worlds and merge them together. So what we find at firms like ours and what you'd find at other financial services and trading houses is, you know, they're trying to take the automation and uh, scale of a quant process, but still capture that through data uh, and apply the data to where it matters most. So we know that modeling uh, Netflix might be different than how one would project the revenues of Apple or Boeing or, you know, Caterpillar versus Alibaba or whatever it is, right? Um, and so this has been one of the major drivers for I think groups being created like mine and investment within data and technology across what have traditionally been very much sort of the um, you know, fundamental, what we would call kind of fundamental investment shocks. So you, know, you see this in a lot of uh, the large uh, vanguards, you know, the, the large uh, mutual fund ETF complexes they have quantitative and systematic offerings, and they also have blended offerings. And again, sort of along this quantumental term. It's a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek term because you're obviously taking the quant and the fundamental and just putting them together. But it sounds better than uh, fundamatic or something else, I guess. Um, so that's one of the key things to know about our industry and sort of the evolution of, of, of data within it. Um, that's led to... Uh, a lot of data dependency, obviously. So as things be, have become more programmatic and the, the difficulty in finding in information advantage has become more challenging, you tend to lean toward things that scale better and that can allow you to um, you know, have sustainable advantage. And so it looks like uh, you know, looking at more data, it looks like using the latest data. Uh, in, in our case, we are very reliant on cloud technology, which if you were to look at financial firms like ours 20 years ago, um, they would never even do. Uh, they started to adopt it maybe 10 years ago. And now there are some even very large firms who are still even just trying to do uh, sort of a transition into the cloud still and things. But you find that uh, technology, data engineering, and really what is the guts of being a great data organization uh, provides a lot of 
uh, uh, benefit to to the organization. You know, I think um, I think the way one of my colleagues described it is, you know, 20 years ago, uh, data was sort of uh, okay. Yeah, we need to have it, and it allows me to do other work. Now the idea is we must have it, and it's got to be better than others because that is where a large part of our competitive advantage comes from. Um, so it's, it's pretty pressure, pressure packed, admittedly, but it's also an amazing place to operate um, just because of the scale, the diversity of challenge, and really the technology of folk, uh, first approach I think, it, I think it takes. I'm sure there's a, several vendors on this call listening to this going like, hey, we can help. This is, what we, this is why we were created too. And you're absolutely right. You know, uh, Things like Databricks, Snowflake, those are all being now widely adopted within financial services um, for the benefits that they provide. All right, so if that's a little bit of the background and foundation for um, our industry, at least from my perspective, um, I thought what I could do is talk about how one of the things that I believe can be applicable to all firms, and certainly one of the things that we talk about a lot here at, at BAM, and that is building data products. And um, you know, data products is a term which you know, isn't necessarily that popularized. I haven't, I haven't heard about it a lot, um, you know, but, I, but I think it's a fairly easy concept to understand. And, uh, and so I thought we could spend a little time just going through that because it's really one of the hallmarks of how, uh, you know, our organization works. So, you know, a data product in, in my view is something which uh, meets the business needs or meets our users' needs. Uh, a product itself is something which by definition also serves multiple individuals versus the one. You know, and what I found, um, you know, at times within our organization or certainly in, in uh, discussions with other, you know, chief data officers or uh, you know, analytics leads and chief analytics officers and all the folks who uh, are part of this great community uh, within, within this symposium um, is that, uh, it, you know, we can often fall into trap of building something for one individual to answer one question and not achieve sort of the sustained advantage that comes with doing data incrementally and doing it right. And so on our team, when we talk about data products, we always use the term building for the multi, right? So I might get a question, a business intelligent question and have an easy way I could spin that up in Tableau or I could create a dashboard and I could quickly answer that. That's one thing, you know, and sometimes you have to do that work. But I, I actually think what makes a great data organization is taking a step back and saying, okay, what are the other five other dashboards that we might get? Or what are the five other questions, probably is a better way of terming it, that we want to answer from, you know, for the business or for this portfolio manager or for this trading decision? And what that does for a data organization is it puts them in a place, I think, of, of more unity and with their users and also um, al allows there to be a lot more engagement and collaboration partnership with, with those end users. You know, I don't think um, I don't think anyone wants to work in an organization, you know, we kind of where where you feel like you're separated from business decisions. And you know, depending on the, the size of the organization, the maturity, data can sometimes be seen as sort of just, you know, a part of technology or you know, a small group, maybe data is federated out into multiple groups within an organization. Uh, you know, it's not consolidated. And, and, you know, I find that those orientations are really hard to gain a lot of competitive advantage for just because you don't have the scale. You know, you've kind of, by definition, broken it all apart. And so what we try to do here at BAM is we try to bring that all together. And here's an example of, of that. So one of the things that it's probably keen to a lot of folks on this call. Or, and if it's not part of your core business, it might just be personally interesting was what was happening in COVID, right? And so, you know, as a financial firm, the impacts of COVID are always top of mind. And certainly during the beginning of the pandemic, they were top of mind. And so one of the products that we would create for the firm was effectively a set of business intelligence tools that tracked multiple facets around what was happening in COVID. 
You know, it started off with uh, kind of the same sources that you would read about in uh, the paper, right? It's the John Hopkins, um, you know, case information and the vaccination information. It's the hospitalization utilization stuff. Um, and for our team, we thought about this as a data product. And what that meant for us is it's not just from one source, it's from multiple sources. It's not just for one type of investor or portfolio manager, it's for multiple types. And so what happened over time was certainly we started with some of that public information that we would web scrape down and then you know, make look really good to, for, 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 our, for our decision makers. It also meant that we could receive ideas from across the business and add that into a, a singular analytic that just continued to grow over time. You know, there's no one way to look at COVID. The impacts of COVID are multifaceted. And so us just saying, well, here's what's happening in, you know, the number of hospitalization beds that are being taken up. That's just one aspect. But if we can build a data product that allows us to take inputs from our equity team, right? Here's how, this is what I would look like if we were thinking about stocks or our credit team. This is what I would think about if we were looking at bankruptcies or our, you know, other groups. Over time, this became, you know, an actual really amazing data product that was able to satisfy, you know, tens, if not hundreds of questions all at once. And so that's, I think that is one of my big philosophical beliefs is that in, you know, putting these things together and orienting a data organization such that you're trying to meet the needs of the users and you're okay with knowing that it's going to be really challenging and that data is going to be really dirty and messy, just knowing that that is inherent in all data jobs, you can really focus then on where the value add is and have those and have those conversations and accrue that over time. You know, one of the other one of the other things I believe is that uh, great data organizations are built through incremental steps. There's no big bang with data, you know, uh, and I think uh, a lot of folks can talk about machine learning and AI. And when you talk to those teams and those data scientists, they'll tell you that it doesn't, you know, like to Boz, your, your earlier point, yeah. all that's only possible if the other 80% is done really, really well. It's done really, really well. And I like the, you know, the, the point around the, the, your view that the uh, data product is multifaceted and answering many questions, multi-use case driven. Uh, that's a you know, great way of, and then consumable by many, many actors effectively or stakeholders in the organizations to answer questions which of tomorrow are the questions of you know yesterday, yeah. but both questions have been asked, yeah, both questions of tomorrow, right. but also questions of today and, and the past. So it's you know, multifaceted in both angles in terms of the future and the past, but also multiple questions in terms of business outcomes yeah, and, and, and insights which can be attributed. And that differs from, in my, you know, just a dialogue in here is that definition of data products differs from when traditionally, and if you look at an enterprise organization, IT would create a, uh, a data mart um, right. and be predefined. And, you know, and, and you know, these data marts are created, but the answers are known, yeah? They're, you That's predefined right. the data model, the schema and so on in the cube and so, in, in what you've done, but you sort of locked yourself in the known set of questions, yeah? Yeah, I think that's right. And yeah, so one of the other, yeah, and I think one of the other things in terms of even those data marts that we've seen, certainly here and, and at other, other places, is an increasing trend toward making sure you capture all the data. I think, I think right. technology was such, you know, five, 10 years ago, uh, probably not five years ago, but 10 years ago, where you would try to find what you needed to answer the question you had. We're in the position now of saying, give us everything you can, because we don't know what questions we're going to want to ask next month. So as a data organization, let us take on everything. Let us organize that in a way in which we have sort of a point in time view. And by point in time, I mean uh, being able to look at what the data was then as it is now, look at all the deltas, look at all the changes, right? So that if I rolled back the clock, I saw exactly what that data set looked like through two, three years ago versus how they've restated it since bring in all that information and make those business decisions. Yeah. It's very, you know, data, data products is, is, I mean, just candidly, it is stealing the idea of product management. 
okay. and applying it to a data organization. Great product managers build, you know, if you're selling uh, a widget or you're selling something, that product manager is trying to identify the needs of the biggest, you know, client base possible, right? To sell that product. And we try to do the same thing with our data products. Yeah. A great analogy with um, product management and the thinking of product management around understanding what the market is trying to do and how to fit the product. Product market fit for your product, basically. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, in fact, I send all of my, mm -hmm. right now, uh, uh, across the street, my data managers are going through a product management training. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yeah. So um, definitely a big believer. Here's an example maybe of uh, proprietary data collection, just to, just to, you know, some of the rumors are true that you read about hedge funds collecting data and the like, and this is a cool one that I, that I always like to mention. So, you know, one of the things that we do is we invest in companies that uh, have video game releases and launches, right? And so as part of, uh, and, and there isn't necessarily information out there, there's not a subscriber that you can get to that just tells you, how that new game launch is going or who's using it and who's adopted it and that type of thing. And so we have our teams actually create data products for our investment teams, which look like funny things. Like if those of you are familiar, you have kids, you might've seen them watch other people playing video games on Twitch, right? Uh, going through and I'm going to watch someone play, you know, call of duty and there's a Twitch stream and there's a bunch of comments there. Um, our own team monitors Twitch and will then capture sort of users and subscribers. We might look at Reddit and some of the postings there and hear complaints like, you know, oh man, in version two of this game, uh, the bazooka is now a dollar when the in-game purchase used to be 25 cents. I hate this. You know, all that kind of information we then try to distill into data, which can then be used, you know, to, to, to help our analysts make, make decisions. Uh, so there's also a data product can also be, a, you know, generating this information uh, and, and it's not just sort of ingesting it. Uh, I, I sorry, of, Carson, just yeah. a, qu a question just come in, which I think is, you know, we, we, I could leave it along to the end, but I think it's contextual in terms of what we just talked about. And you know, the question which is asking is, how do you handle um, business data discovery? Do you have a business glossary or catalog for search? And I'm, how so, do you keep glad, it I'm yeah. so glad you asked that. Uh, I will, yeah, I'll answer that right now, in fact. So, you know, this is proprietary data collection. We sort of talked about sourcing. I've kind of mentioned uh, antenna and the like, but you're absolutely right. So we have a data catalog and this is what it looks like. So behind the scenes, we've using a GraphQL database, we've taken all of the information on vendors and, you know, providers that are out there. There's, you know, thousands and thousands of those. We have a Salesforce database that tracks all that. We also have, you know, who's getting what within the firm. Our firm is, um, I don't know what the exact number is, but let's call it 1,500 people. Mm -hmm. Different teams subscribe to different things and some have access to some things that others don't and the like. We've captured all that information into uh, a data catalog. And this is a screenshot of it. This is what it looks like. One of the big things I think that can really help, uh, you know, data leads, data managers, CDOs is to, you know, uh, move an organization toward complete transparency. And even at a hedge fund, which tends to be very secretive, and we have certain rules and, you know, a neighbor can't necessarily see what their, you know, what their other neighbor is subscribing to in effect. There's IP considerations to have in these, in these firms. But generally speaking, knowing that a data set exists in the world, it's hard to argue that that's IP. You know, we often joke here that if you've learned about a data set at a conference, it's probably only new to you, you know, like there, there are teams and there's organizations with catalogs and reports and salespeople who are, who are, uh, you know, trying to sell this data. And, and a lot of times it's known. So yeah, one of the, what, Baz, to your, to your, to the question, one of the key things that's helped us is building uh, a very slick interface that allow users to filter down data sets that uh, might be of interest to them. Uh, I won't go into all the details because I'm not allowed to, but you know, behind the scenes here, if you were to double click on some of this stuff, you would find access points, API calls, code snippets, documentation on the data sets, and even some evaluation by our teams. Got it, understand. Thanks yep. for that, Chris. Cool. Well, I know we're, um, we're coming up on time. I thought I would, 
if I haven't convinced you to become a CDO later in your career, I thought I thought I would try my best here. And because uh, I love it. Um, and just talk maybe about some of the learnings that I've had being in this job. I've only been in this job um, really through serendipity and, and for five years and I've just made a ton of mistakes, learned a lot of things. I thought I would talk to some uh, keys to success. So the first thing I believe is that culture is tantamount. And um, even at an, a, an old, what you might call an old school, uh, maybe not the most uh, technologically advanced organization, I really think that a data organization can be something unique, can be a diamond in, in the most staid and uh, unappreciative or world. And you know, the people who love data generally have a ton of grit. They know this stuff is messy. They're willing to roll up their sleeves. They're willing to help one another because it's tough work. And they're also highly pragmatic. You know, and I think the pragmatism within a data organization is really what can differentiate success from failure, because that means that a leader isn't overcommitting the organization to do something that it can't. It's not promising AI. I do not promise machine learning can replace all of our investment professionals because it cannot. It cannot. It would be it would be foolish for me to suggest that as a CDO. Um, so you, you lead with a ton of pragmatism uh, and I often say, never talk about the buzzwords. Yes, we do NLP. Yes, we have AI. Yes, we have machine learning. That's fine. Those are all tools to answer a particular problem or challenge. That's not what you lead with. You lead with technology, getting the data right, getting the blocking and tackling right. You earn the right, in my, in, in my experience, to do those higher order things once you've got the foundation built. Um, you know, I... I, granted, I'm in it, so I'm a little biased, but I, I actually think uh, what we'll find is more people are going to move toward a centralized data organization model. I've read, you know, there's a lot of articles from the consultants and things on where does the CDO report? And listen, they can report anywhere. It can all work. Org, org design does not, you know, the, the, is, is not the cast through which, uh, you know, success is, is, is made. But uh, I certainly believe that as data becomes more of that competitive advantage at firms like ours, you're going to find the investment going into that and, um, you know, classic application development, infrastructure and technology will remain in technology. But, you know, it takes a little bit of a different breed often to uh, to do data right. And so I think I think we'll see more of that. I believe in an outside in approach as a CDO that goes back to sort of this product management data data product idea. One of the, um, you know, more cynical, <laughs> albeit uh, kind, things that we say on our team is, uh, and I've been told this multiple times, you know, your opinion while interesting is irrelevant. Meaning I might think that there's some great thing we should be doing as a group. Okay. I, I should really validate that with our portfolio managers or our users or our business users, right? So it's that outside in approach. We often, we also say that, um, you know, the answers to our four walls are not in this room. Or, or the answers to our questions are not in, these, in this room. Uh, I'm a big believer in, in a group called Pragmatic Institute, which is the training I have all my folks going through now. They're great at, at um, they're, they're great if you want to send your teams through product management training. They also have separate lines for developers and even product marketing folks who are thinking about, you know, product market fit and, and things like that. Um, it's not about org design. This is our org design. But, and this is predicated on the needs of our business. You know, uh, I will say that one of the things that was really a light bulb for me was understanding uh, the need to have like a client success or service organization on top of engineering. So we have a lot of specialty engineering happening within our businesses, equities, macro, commodities, credit. Uh, but what you often find is the folks doing the, the hardest work, it's, it's very, you know, these are, these are long projects, these are big projects. You can't also ask them to answer, you know, the, the, the requests or the questions that come from users all the time. And so one of the things that we've done is built effectively a, a service organization on top of data engineering. We call it client success and quality um, to, to, our, to be that first level of support. Um, you know, but again, multiple models can work. Um, and uh, I really think it just comes down to the people, you know, hire the best people, hire the smartest people. 
uh, let them run, don't micromanage them, and you'll probably be off to a pretty good success. Um, and then the last thing just, I would just, just highlight. Say, uh, yeah. Your points there at Carson, just add to uh, kind of the recipe for success in terms of leading and leadership styles. <clears throat> the, the point about culture and, and empathy um, was brought up earlier in a different forum here where you know, a lot of um, data governance and the, the tactical blocking and tackling activities of data are covered. But the kind of the reasons why we're doing this, as you said in your data products, is the why, the outcomes you're doing, is not always understood by the people who yeah. are in the data factory, if I call it that, yeah? The lights right. are. And so what you've done here, and just replaying it back, is that you've been able to, to explain to your organization that we're building data products, but they have business value and outcomes and why we're doing this and the success of the business exists. And so the, the empathy of understanding the reasons why we're doing this to get the grit and the support from the organization, your data team is a kind of key. What we heard this morning is that's not always the case. You're, you're, in, you're asked to do a governance role, a data quality role, and you're kind of in a mushroom effectively. Right. Left, left alone to do it. And you don't know nobody was switching the light onto that. So it's great to see that in terms of your, you know, your leadership style. Yeah. I've been in I've been in prior positions like that too. And you know, what I've found even here, um, what I found is you know, governance itself is a bit of a it's a tough word because it sounds very uh, rote, right. you know, like the government. It sounds bureaucratic um, <laughs> when it's really crucial. Uh, but I found that, you know, as a data leader, getting the people in the room is not that hard. There's nothing stopping you from inviting your business users to come talk to your teams, right. you know? And so we just try to really do that a lot. Like, you know, my job is not to report on the work of my team. My job is to put the people doing the work in the room with the people they're serving so they can talk about the work. You know, and I think if, if, if people can take that model, I, I believe that's a, I work for, I work for several people who had that same philosophy and I learned from them. Uh, but I think as leaders, if you can do that more, what you find is, um, yeah, those connections are already there. You're not, you don't have to sort of be this, you know, uh, information hub trying to retranslate business needs to, to your teams. Now put your teams in the room. Have those have the CLO of this business come in and say, "Hey, here's what we need from you guys. Here's what we're thinking about. Here's where we're growing. You guys are really important." And then watch your team run out and try to, you know, conquer Everest because that's what generally happens. You know, yeah, I think it's a great point. These are our values. I won't lead through them. I think we kind of. I hope you can hear my voice. Kind of how we try to. Um, we're not perfect. We have family fights all the time, but you know, these are sort of what we go back to, and uh, I think it's really important to to define that for folks. Yeah, happy to answer any questions. Um, should time allow? I think we've got we're good here, um, Carson. In terms of the other, no other questions come through. I think I've asked on behalf of others as as we go forward. Um, uh, but I you know, just want one question in terms of you hear a lot about having to explain um, this kind of the, the logic in AI, so responsible AI, your thoughts on, because you obviously you're bringing a lot of data from investment perspectives, your thoughts on this area around responsibility and social AI, what, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure I, I'm the best position to talk about that. I mean, certainly, you know, the use of AI within financial firms is, um, is still in its early stages. You know, we're probably in inning two or three of what it really could be. Um, and I've yet to see really uh, an application of AI that um, isn't, isn't defined as being sort of an, a part of the to solution versus just the whole solution. Um, all that to say is, um, you know, I think uh, we're still kind of early days uh, it's definitely an area of emphasis for us, uh, specifically because things are becoming more systematized within our business uh, and trying to uncover, you know, 
um, connections and correlations that you know classic techniques couldn't find. Um, but even then, even when those things are sort of uh, discovered or or the AI can sort of help you identify or machine learning can help you identify that stuff, you know, we often come back to how can we how can we ground that into some actual understanding by us? You know, the model says to do this. Why is it even saying it? We have no idea. We're probably not going to use that model. Um, I feel like I didn't answer no, 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 that no, no, well. No, no. Yeah. no, you got to give us a good point. There's a question which just come in, which is, um, just going to read it out as it is, is, what was one of the, what was one of the best mistakes you've learned from within the past year as a CDO? Best mistakes. Um, I mean, there's so many mistakes. Um, You know, I think when you're representing an organization of, you know, such talent and a lot of young talent, I, you know, I, I can sometimes fall into the trap of becoming a little defensive, especially when asked about business value or, hey, what's the actual, you know, I'll get asked, what's the value of this data set? Well, I have no idea, really. I mean, it's used by these four groups and uh, one of, you know, one of them is making money, three of them aren't. I, it's hard. It's hard to know. Uh, and so I, you know, I think, um, again, getting back to being sort of, uh, objective and, uh, and working with your, your business sponsors and users, uh, to really find what is working, taking a lot of critical feedback to be in a data organization is to take a lot of critical feedback, right? By definition, it's like an asymmetrical feedback loop. When things break, you get a call when things are working, no one talks to you. And so, uh, you know, guiding a good day at the office when that happens, you know? Yeah, exactly. And so I think, um, er, early in this role, I took the mistake of taking a lot of that too personally, probably, because I thought my team was working very too hard and we were working very hard and we still do. But at the time of, of our creation, it was really, really, um, tough. And, um, and I realized that, just being candid about the fears and some of the concerns you have about your own data organization helps. Like people get it. I'm really fearful that we're not going to do this right. Okay. Let, thanks for saying that. How can we help you? That type of approach. Um, the other thing is it's, you have to put people in the right seats. So when something is not working, you have to change it. And if, if you put a, you know, a manager in place that isn't working out or, you know, if people are, are what happens in our organization is, they get because they become so talented that you know people want to hire them internally. They want to, they want to, they want them. To. So one of the mistakes that I made early on was I would try to keep them. That was totally the wrong thing to do. You lean into that and you say, "Great, I want to be a feeder of talent for the organization because that's what it's going to be anyway." So now let's let's try to optimize how we can make that the best that serves our organization and serves you know their next three career steps for every individual. Um, it's great, great, know. great, great, great uh, insights around not being overly sensitive to criticism in terms of your yeah, power. but it's, it's also, challenge. Yeah, yeah it's and then also the leadership in terms of nurturing talent and and, and letting go really to to uh, to give to give to get respectively. That's right. Is yeah. that right? How you how to summarize what you said there? And then just one final question: Any color on the interaction with risk, in particular when it comes down to machine learning and risk? Um, machine learning and risk. Well, in our world, risk means a couple things. Risk means sort of um, the probability that something that we predict isn't going to happen. Um, you know, I think um, we use machine learning uh, in two applications primarily. One is in sort of data preparation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, un uh, structuring unstructured data and the like. We also have, uh, you know, some strategies that rely on machine learning as part of their investment decision-making process. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of risk in either of those. Um, I think in the case of the latter, it's, you know, um, much like AI, it's, we're still in the early innings of some of the applicability of that within finance. And um, the challenge with some of these new, or, you know, these new technologies uh, I mentioned to be a great data organization, you, it's about incremental progress over time. 
you know, what I've seen is there's at, at certain firms, there's a lot of sort of boom and bust, you know, chasing the shiny AI object or ML object that doesn't pay off. All of a sudden that team is gone and then rinse and repeat two years later, rinse and repeat three years later. Um, and so again, if you can ground, if you can ground these data-driven decisions in a lot of pragmatism, uh, those shots become not the only shot you're taking, you know, they become an incremental thing, which if they pay off, you can, you can continue to invest in and, and grow. Um, so I don't know if there's necessarily a lot of risk in that, if I understood I the question. I, I like the rinse and repeat, and I've seen that in some of my clients where it's kind of the shiny new thing to go after, two years of that exploded. And yeah, so what was the value that? in the data science team two years later? We don't know. Okay, maybe we should get real. That's not how it should work. That's not how it should work. Incremental, which is great. Um, well, uh, Carson, appreciate all your time here and yeah, sharing your insights. It's an honor to be on this uh, symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you. And great to have you on board. And with that, thank you so much. And have a great day. Bye, everybody. Bye.